Okay, we're ready to start. Thanks for coming, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation by the American Civil Defense Association. My name is Roseanne Hassett. I am the executive director for TACTA, and I'll be your host tonight. Legally, I need to remind you that nothing in this presentation should be considered legal, medical, or financial advice. The opinions of the viewers can differ considerably and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of TACTA. You should always do your own research and consult with professionals. The format tonight is informal. We'd like to allow questions on the fly so the answers will be in context. Feel free to also use the chat feature and we'll do our best to get those questions answered. The topic for tonight is EMP and our vulnerability presented by Paul Seifrey. Paul serves on our advisory committee and is also an expert on underground sheltering, EMP, and really all things civil defense. So with that, I will now turn the time over to Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Roseanne. Um, we've seen a lot of um, banter lately on uh, media about the possibility of nuclear war. And uh, I think it's a good time to review a little bit about um, what EMP is because EMP represents such a, a huge threat to the United States uh because we are a very electronic society everything in our lives is, is governed by electronics and um in passing i would like to note that we lost two giant figures in the um nuclear weapons community who did a lot of research on emp and over the last quarter century and even longer that would be uh, dr lowell wood who I'll be quoting from today. Dr. Lowell Wood um, was a prominent nuclear weapons physicist who worked with Dr. Teller and others at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory designing uh, next generation nuclear weapons among, among many other projects. And um, he also was uh, chairman of the EMP commission, the, the formal name for which was the commission, the Congressional Commission to Assess the Threat of Electromagnetic Pulse to the United States, which uh, has been active and dormant and active and dormant uh, several times over the past 25 years. And uh, the other figure we lost, well, actually we've lost Brown Sakotis also. You know, he was, he was um, in charge of running the technical section for the commission and actually uh, did a lot of the hands-on uh, testing with simulators and vehicles and locomotives and aircraft and other things. Uh, and we lost him in uh, 2014, I believe. Um, now, uh, we also lost Dr. Peter Pry. Peter Vincent Pry uh, was a uh, Air Force nuclear weapon ear for, for several years before joining the CIA and became a senior uh, analyst at the CIA. And he was also a key member of the EMP commission. And uh, we've, we miss him greatly because he was um, such a passionate um, advocate for preparing against the, the effects of EMP. And um, so I guess what we ought to do is ask, what is EMP? Uh, and, and when we use the term EMP in this context, we're, we're do, using it uh, for nuclear generated EMP or high altitude EMP. Um, there are other ways to generate electromagnetic pulses that are non-nuclear, but we'll be fo focusing primarily on the nuclear aspect of it. Um, so I'm going to borrow a little bit from Dr. Lowell Wood's congressional testimony from the year 2001 um, because he makes such a compact and tidy uh, definition of what exactly EMP is, what the character of it is, and what it does. And so I'm going to um, just quote him for a little bit here. 
Uh, electromagnetic pulse is really severe static electricity everywhere all at once without needing to understand the undeniability Esot the undeniably esoteric means by which EMP arises in various military circumstances, it suffices to recall that it presents itself as something closely akin to static electricity, extremely intense, but exceedingly brief everywhere within light of sight to a high altitude nuclear explosion all at once. This static electric electricity pulse is carried on radio frequency electromagnetic waves of uniquely high intensity. The bomb's extraordinarily intense prompt radiations essentially transform the entire atmosphere underneath it into a gigantic radio transmitter antenna, radiating at maximum possible intensity for a very brief interval. The firebombs, or the bomb's fireball expanding rapidly in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field gives rise to a second manifestation of EMP, which is of particular significance for long metallic lines, such as electrical and telephone systems. Extended metallic structures within line of sight of the explosion, telephone and electrical lines, radio and TV antenna, fence wires, etc., then serve to gather up the broadcast energy of EMP and deliver it into whatever they connect to, often with locally ruinous results which appear retrospectively to the basically, sim to the basically similar to those resulting from a lightning strike. However, since the damage occurs thousands of times more swiftly than does that of a lightning strike, most types of lightning protective devices are essentially useless. Since it travels at the speed of light, EMP arrives essentially instantaneously from the general direction of the explosion. EMP can blanket an entire US-sized continent from a single source. EMP originates primarily in the interaction of gamma radiation from a nuclear explosion with the Earth's atmosphere at altitudes of a few dozen kilometers and propagates predominantly toward the Earth's surface. The low frequency long time component of EMP arises from the fireball interactions with the Earth's magnetic field as already noted. Thus, you can readily see a bomb's explosion of a few hundred kilometers above the central US from anywhere in the lower 48 the EMP arising from that explosion's interactions with the Earth's atmosphere can also see you. To be sure, at greater distances, the intensity of the pulse will be somewhat smaller, but usually not as indicated by the familiar inverse square of the distance law. Likewise, its severity is generally not well relegated to the yield or total energy production of the bomb. The initial sharpness of the EMP usually depends on rather sensitively on esoteric aspects of the bomb's design and operation. Low yield, especially designed bombs may pose as large or even larger EMP threats at both low and high electromagnetic frequencies as do high yield ordinary ones. So we can see there that a nuclear weapon doesn't necessarily have to be in the multi megaton range or the megaton range to cause a great deal of damage that even a weapon say in in a, a 10 kiloton size like the, the of the type uh, used on the attacks of Japan. Um, can also create a great deal of havoc on the ground. Um, EMP is much greater threat to very large electrical systems than it is to small ones. So while our power systems and our telephone systems, uh, telecommunications and so forth are um, very vulnerable to this problem, the, your cell phone, for example, may not be damaged because it's a very small device and it does not have long runs of circuitry in it that, that would be used to, um, harvest the energy from the pulse. Uh, laptop computers may even survive. In fact, I've seen tests um, of laptops and handheld radios that were exposed to 50,000 volts per square meter in a simulator um, work just fine afterward. Although the laptop had to be rebooted, uh, it had to be turned off and rebooted and it came up and worked just fine. So, I guess what we're trying to say is that the main problem that we're going to have with EMP is what it does to the critical infrastructure that supports our lifestyle. And 
um, I guess we ought to ask ourselves who who is capable of of causing an EMP attack on the United States, and the answer would be anyone who can lift a nuclear device over the target, which would be the United States. So uh, we we've seen the um, recent press coverage of the Chinese spy balloon drifting all across the United States uh, recently, and um, a lot of banter has been. Um, seen about the possibility of using a balloon for an EMP attack, and that's certainly possible. But if someone were to use an EMP um, device trans transported by a balloon, the effects would not be nearly as far reaching as they would be if it was uh, it launched by a rocket into space. So were were that balloon to be used for an EMP attack, the size of the geographical area affected would be maybe the size of the Ohio Valley, for example, from um, maybe eight, eight to 10 states would be uh, knocked out. Um, the secondary effects from an attack like that would, would probably cause a cascading effect on the other power grids that are connected to those local grids. But, oh yeah, and the, um, the effects themselves, the harshness and the duration of the uh, E1 and E2 and E3 uh, portions of the pulse would be uh, limited in scope. So the damage wouldn't be as severe, but it would still be catastrophic. Um, so those the countries that could do that to us would be primarily Russia, China, North Korea, Pakistan, the UK, France, India, and Israel. Now, a few of those countries you don't have to worry about because at this time they're friendly countries toward the United States, but uh, the others, um, well, especially North Korea and China and Russia, of course, can, can uh, have, the, have the technical means to do that. Uh, and I would like to point out that the Russians realizing that uh, EMP represented a, a great threat to their infrastructure, uh, also realized that it created a great potential for military use against its enemies, like the United States. And um, so they have, they have developed means of, of using EMP on the United States. But at the same time, they spent a great deal of effort and time hardening their own military systems and their own uh, infrastructure, their electrical infrastructure and communications infrastructure against the effects of the United States. The United States, on the other hand, has not made any significant effort at all to harden uh, the general infrastructure. Um, only the strategic nuclear forces uh, of, of the Air Force and the Navy have, <laughs> have, have uh, hardened, hardened systems, but um, the power, the, the electrical uh, providers in the United States and the telecommunications industry have not made any significant effort toward hardening their systems. Does somebody have a question? I thought I heard a comment somewhere. Okay. EMP basically is divided up into three segments. And um, we're going to call that E1, E2, and E3. Uh, E1 is particularly dangerous to electronic systems because the rise time on E1 is so very fast, which is somewhere between one and five nanoseconds or five billionths of a second. And um, the, uh, the surge protection devices that are installed on the power grid and in uh, other smaller systems to uh, protect systems against the effects of lightning, you generally clamp somewhere around 80 millionth of a second or longer, take 80 millionth of a second or, or longer to clamp. And um, the devices that are needed to protect against EMP have to clamp, you know, you, in less than five nanoseconds to um, achieve the desired effect. Um, The widespread use of 
integrated circuits or chips in our infrastructure makes us particularly vulnerable. And it's hard to pick up anything nowadays that does not have an integrated circuit in it. So like a cordless drill today or, or a, um, a regular power drill that we plug into the grid, uh, that, that has a circuit card in it that regulates the function of that appliance. Our refrigerators, uh, our, of course, our televisions and all the other things in our, in our daily lives um, are all filled with chips. Even the um, lithium batteries that we use in our cars and our uh, small appliances all have chips in them to regulate function. Um, now we have other things called SCADA systems, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. And uh, SCADA systems are embedded throughout all of our infrastructure uh, widely. And those silently do their jobs regulating um, the function and operation of everything in, in our system. <clears throat> um, the one I want to draw attention to at the moment is the E3 effect. Um, E3 is the latent long-term effect that lasts up to 35 minutes, um, which in, it's caused by the, the atmosphere, or the, I'm sorry, the, the magnetic field of the earth collapsing back in upon itself. Um, after it, it was been, it's been disturbed by the, the explosion in the upper atmosphere. So as the magnetic lines collapse back into their natural alignment, it induces these very powerful uh, low voltage but high amperage surges in long power lines. So instead of um, ten, uh, millions of volts per mile of power line uh, being absorbed, we're looking at tens of volts per mile, but thousands of amps. And um, this is the component that we see melting down uh, the 700 ton um, high voltage transformers at power plants, of which there are about 6,000 throughout the United States. Uh, and these are the transformers that take years to build and uh, are very difficult to replace. Uh, and I think only recently have we opened a plant in the United States that will actually manufacture a, a high voltage uh, transformer. Most of them are made in Scandinavia or China and uh, take a long, long, long time to, to build. Um, but EMP, EMP E3 represents a direct threat to our homes. And uh, Bronze Cotus warned me about this in 2005 uh, and, and warned me that the E3 uh, phase would cause the wiring in our homes to glow for a significant period of time, like the wires in our toaster. Uh, and I thought about that and that sounded, that sounded pretty serious, but I, I didn't, I didn't have a, a good picture of what that meant until I saw these photographs that were, um, exhibited by Dr. Peter Vincent Pry. Uh, the, the pictures that you see on your screen right now are, is, are examples of household wiring that were, um, basically set on fire during a simulation of E3 in a, in a national laboratory. So this, this is an actual EMP E3 test. And, um, you know, when, you, when we ask ourselves, where's, where's all of our emergency water, our emergency clothes, our food and, and, and so forth that we, you know, have put away for, a, for hard times. Uh, well, it's probably in our house. And, if this EMP effect causes our house to burn down and all of our supplies are in our house, that could be a problem. So what I would like to do is talk. To, yes. Um, is your screen advancing or is the PowerPoint advancing? Uh, no, I, I have not asked for it to be advanced. Oh, got it. Thank you. Okay. So as long as you got an interruption there, I have a question about what you just said, Paul. Okay. If you were to 
connect your home at the main switch where it enters the house, would that alleviate setting the wiring on fire or would it couple just through the house itself and still set it on fire? The, the coupling effect with E3 is not nearly as severe as it is with E1 and E2. So if you were to, if, if, if the breakers were to be thrown on your home, the E3 effect would stop this problem from, from heating up your house wiring. Um, now, if you're on off-grid solar, then this is not a problem to you because it is the surge that is collected by the entire grid that is the main problem here. There isn't enough wiring in your house that would that would collect enough high high amperage to cause this phenomenon. So there's another way you could um, protect your home or your building, and that is by the use of an isolation transformer. And an iso isolation transformer would block this and probably most of the effects of E1 and E2 as well from entering your building. Now, with the E1 and E2 effect, which are very short-lived, and very high intensity, but short-lived, um, there's a lot of wiring in the walls of your house that would act as an antenna, but you would still get far, far less energy in your appliances and so forth if you were not on the grid. So that's, that's the main takeaway from that. Um, what, one last question. The E3 being a longer period, would not the circuit breakers in the house take care of that and trip? No. Or, or maybe not? The problem is that probably the E2 effect would probably basically weld the contacts together. Oh, nice. So... It, it would be it, it yeah the breakers won't throw they they take far too long and uh, all the damage would have been done by e1 and e2 before they began to move seems i knew that yeah thank you um now in 2014 uh bronze came and made a presentation to tacta about EMP and coronal mass ejection. And uh, it was outstanding presentation. And then we we retired to the Hires restaurant up on 7th East for a hamburger. And some of the people on this, on this, in this meeting were there. And um, you know, over hamburgers and root beer, Braun was a little bit more relaxed. And um, and he he made a comment to me: the cities will die get out and um then he went back to talking about what he was doing in virginia uh but that 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 statement kind of stuck with me for a long time and what he was what he meant was is that there will be no there will be no drinking water in the cities because everything that keeps us alive in the cities revolves around electricity. Uh, and so to kind of get a better flavor for that, I walked into the West Jordan City Water Works in 2016 and asked to speak with a civil engineer there. And a, a nice man in his 60s came out of the office and we chatted for about 45 minutes. And uh, after he was satisfied that I wasn't there to learn how to sabotage the water system, he, he told me that we get 82% of our drinking water in West Jordan, or basically the valley, the Wasatch Front, gets 82% of its drinking water from the reservoirs, uh, Deer Creek, Jordanelle, Pine View. And um, we get 18% of West Jordan water from the wells. Well, they don't like to run the wells unless they have to, perhaps in the summertime, to meet extra demand for sprinklers and so forth because it pulls the contaminated aquifer from the Kennecott copper operation closer to the city. So they use the wells only if they have to. And so I asked him what, what would happen if we had a 7.5 earthquake on the Wasatch front to the, to the water system. And he said, well, the big problem would be the serious damage to the concrete aqueducts that bring all that water down the canyons 
to the water treatment plants that would you know and 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 would be treated before it was distributed to the to customers and he said that could take four to six months to repair the damage but he said we could keep the city alive on just the wells if they all worked and if we could maintain a supply of diesel fuel to the generators that are um, constructed at the at the pump houses and if no one took a shower and uh, of course i said nobody i'm sure nobody will cheat and take a shower but uh then i asked him what about an electromagnetic pulse and the engineer's face got very serious and he looked straight looked me straight in the eye and he said the city will die so clearly he understood the problem uh, and he was not shy about telling me straightforward, you know, what would happen. And I waited for 15 or 20 seconds to see if maybe a workaround would pop into his head, but uh, there was no workaround forthcoming. So that's, that is something to consider in your long range plans if you're serious about, you know, the possibility of war modern war coming to the United States. And, and so that kind of rolls into what we need to do to prepare our families. Um, a couple of years ago, while I was filling up my truck at the Costco gas station, uh, I spoke to one of the attendants there and um, I asked him how often they got a tanker truck there to uh, replenish the supply at the station and he says he gets four double tankers a day to keep that gas station running so in a 12-hour shift he gets he gets four double tankers that's a tanker every three hours to keep those those customers happy which kind of illustrates to me the fragility of the supply chains that we have grown so accustomed to relying on um So what we need to do going forward is to acquire, first of all, a safe, reliable, robust, and permanent water source, because there will be no water coming out of our faucets for the rest of our lives. And of course, the refrain I often get is, well, I have several drums of water in the basement. And that's good. That gives you you know, a cushion to um, transition to what you're going to need, you know, for the rest of the duration, but the duration is going to be a long time. Uh, because when I was sitting around the lunch table with Bronsacotus and um, Dr. Wood and Edwin York, three people who had extensive professional experience working with EMP, uh, I asked the question, if the United States was struck by an EMP attack. And if we could send a carrier pigeon to Europe uh, asking for help in restoring our grid, and if somebody took our now worthless currency, how long would it take to restore the US power grid after a military EMP attack? And um, the physicists looked at each other around the dinner table and Ed York spoke first and said, one to two decades. That's 10 to 20 years before any, anything resembling the grid that we have now was back online. Uh, now, when you, when you consider that famine is an equal opportunity killer. It doesn't care who you voted for. It doesn't care what your professional skills are or your qualifications are. Uh, if you are not prepared for that, you'll die. And famine is not a word that is often found in the American lexicon. We have not had a famine in basically any any of our nation's history nothing certainly nothing like the asians experienced over the you know last 20 centuries um so 
that that would become a a reality if our supply chains became interrupted by something like EMP. Um, so what you need is to have all the supplies that you're going to need, the medications, the food, the water that you're going to need for the rest of your life. And that's that's kind of a daunting problem because the supply chains are so long and so sophisticated and are uh, controlled by the sophisticated communication systems and the data transmission systems and the financial systems. You know, the your average meal travels uh, uh, 1,400 miles on seven different diesel powered trucks before it arrives at your grocery store. And then you're gonna get in your, your automobile and drive to the store and purchase it. Uh, so you're going to have to make other arrangements for everything you need if, if war comes to the United States. Uh, also, you need to consider that all the men and women who understand the construction of power plants, networks, uh, high voltage cable splicing, um, all the esoteric aspects of, of constructing and operating a power grid, all the supply chains to the power generators, the natural gas, the coal, the nuclear fuels, the lubricants, all the things that are necessary to run a power plant, all those are gonna be interrupted. So you have to stand up all those systems too. So the interdependability of all these different systems uh, is a very complex, thing and it doesn't take much to interrupt that. Um, you're gonna have to have your own alternative power, which brings us to solar. And um, the good news about solar power is that your solar panel is inherently resistant to the effects of electromagnetic pulse. Um, that is, as long as the wiring on your panel is not exposed. So what you need to do when you're building your solar power system, or if you already have a solar power system, is you need to shield the wiring um, that brings power from the panel to the charge controller. I would shield all the wiring that you can in your structure. Uh, then that would prevent the signal from coupling to that wiring and being um, transported into the devices where it could do damage. That's, a, that's the simplest and least expensive thing you can do. There are surge suppressors that are available that will actually you know, defeat E1 and E2 components of EMP, but I, that's beyond the scope of my knowledge. And uh, I have tried to pry information out of people who do understand that, that sort of thing. And they, they are very, stingy about revealing what they know. And um, those individuals happen to work for a company called Solark, S-O-L-A-R-K. Uh, you can find them on the internet, Solark. Uh, they, th this, they're a company that is made up of engineers who worked on EMP hardening for the military and now manufacture uh, solar powered home energy systems and they manufacture uh, large inverters up to 20,000 watts with pure sine wave capability and they have tested their solar panels and their inverters on um, um, EMP simulators up to 132 times at 100,000 volts per square meter without a failure. So they have a proven track record of performance. And um, if you're very serious about this, you can contact Solark. How do you uh, spell that? Uh, S-O-L-A-R-K, two words. Um, I spoke with Tom at a preparedness expo years ago for about four hours and uh, he definitely uh, seemed to know what he was about. 
Um, he has several videos on YouTube. Uh, so you can look up Solark YouTube videos and they, they have some informative videos where they actually show the testing of handheld radios, laptops, light bulbs, uh, inverters, other things <clears throat> on, on the video. Hey, Paul. Uh, yes. There's some questions about cars and EMP. Oh, good. I want to know if their car will be affected by an EMP if it is off. Or another question is how to restart a car that has been affected by EMP if it's possible. Fabulous question. Um, Bronson Cotus actually oversaw the testing of mm, several dozen different cars. Uh, locomotives, uh, diesel trucks, um, aircraft, so forth. And his, his advice to me was that none of the cars that were not running at the time of the insult were affected. Cars that were sitting at rest, engine turned off, started and ran normally. So that's good news. He also said that 94% of the national light vehicle fleet are expected to survive the effects of EMP. Um, vulnerability depends on year, make, and model, which he would not talk much about. Uh, it depends on the orientation of the vehicle to the source of the EMP. It depends on whether or not it is shielded by a large building or a mountain between Omaha, Nebraska, let's say, and the West Coast. Um, it depends on several different factors. Uh, but as long as it's turned off, it'll probably run just fine. Of the vehicles that were running at the time of the insult, some of them kept running and some of them stopped, but could readily be restarted and would run normally. The, a lot of the ancillary systems on the vehicle, such as the intermittent wipers, the radios, uh, most of the small lights failed, but the drivetrain kept functioning. And I think the reason for that is, is that since 1989, manufacturers have been prodded by the federal government to beef up the hardness of the ignition systems in these cars so that they would be more resistant to lightning strikes in the area and to the effects of EMP. Um, <clears throat> now, the vehicles that were tested for the commission probably were made before 2005. And I noticed that the trend among car manufacturers is to load up these cars with tons of sophisticated um, electronic screens, touch screens and so forth, a lot of gadgetry. And I suspect that that will not fare well uh, in an EMP effect, uh, attack. Now, he did concede to me that Dodge products were the worst of the vehicles that they tested. They were more prone to, to fail early. And uh, of those vehicles, he said, you can remove the battery cables from the battery terminals, wait five to 10 minutes and hope that the, um, the electronic control module in the vehicle will reset itself. Maybe it's only upset and it's not destroyed. So it, if it hasn't been destroyed outright, it will reset itself. And then you can reconnect the battery cables and start the car. Of the vehicles that they, that they did this drill with, um, that only worked two or three times, and then the vehicle would not start after that. So got to find another vehicle that wasn't running. And um, maybe you'll be lucky enough to be near a car lot. <laughs> and Paul, uh, uh, one of the advisors had just said, suggested that possibly uh, that we remove the cables from the battery and actually discharge them, uh, touch them together and discharge them before putting them back on. I don't know if that's still viable. I, I can't comment on that. That I don't know is the answer I have. Um, that's possible. You know, your mileage may vary. 
you, I mean, no one's going to tell you you can't do that. I, I personally don't think there'll be any energy in the cables, but I could be wrong. There could be capacitors in there, um, and I don't know what the effect would be. So and, and the last option, possibly we do that. Yeah, last option. Um, so, yeah, the vehicles, the biggest problem with vehicles will be, number one, gridlock because if six percent of the vehicles on the freeway failed um you can imagine the problem that you would have on a, a multi-lane interstate highway especially if the, the the highway were hemmed in by sound walls you know there'd be nowhere to go um and the other problem is the in, the unavailability of fuel because it takes electricity to pump fuel and um, without electricity, get, you know, getting that the fuel remaining in the in the gas station tanks would be very problematic and dangerous. Um, Paul. Yes. We're coming up on um, forty five minutes into our presentation. Wow. You, we still have a bunch of points to talk about. Would you like me to run through your slides real fast and see if you? If you talked about everything you wanted to, or do you want to just um, yeah, let's, give let's another 15 minutes on what your um, whatever? Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Well, on uh, vehicles, there is a product from EMP Doctor, which has been put into the notes that you can connect across your battery that has a fast enough response time to short circuit the E1, E2 two and e3 completely before it ever gets into the vehicle and that product is available i i am not an electrical engineer we have an electrical engineer um that i can talk to about that well the guy who who um is marketing it was a uh, he's a he has a doctorate and he used to work with nasa so he has some qualifications um it seems pretty reasonable i i bought the product it's not cheap but it maybe gives you some. Yeah, better that's, than nothing, that's Dr. Yeah, that's Dr. Arthur Bradley. He is yeah. a NASA PhD, and uh, I'm an architect for off-grid and high-security homes. And we work with uh, Dr. Bradley for a number of our clients. Uh, is a first-rate gentleman, very easy to speak to, and um, he has videos on YouTube. If you scroll up through the the chat, I, I've linked to his web page on YouTube. And he's a great resource. I um, highly encourage everyone to reach out to. I get no money from yeah, I, I, <laughs> I can hear that the guy, the guy seems very reasonable. And, and he shows you how he tests his equipment with uh, signal generators and things like that. Doug, who are who do you work with? What are, who are your clients? So I, I, um, I'm a self-employed architect that started working with hardened structures, hardened shelters back in 2012. And... Um, mm. Uh, I, I, I maintain uh, one step removed independence as a licensed professional, but I have worked with them for about a decade now. Uh, however, um, I, I have gotten great mentoring from Sharon Packer, who's on the call here today. And I really encourage everyone to, you know, uh, also see her as a resource. She's she's kind of one of the luminaries in this field. And um, uh, so I, I stand on the shoulders of other people that came before me. Uh, I'm in my 50s now, but I, I've been at this about a decade, so I have a whole other life before me and other types of architecture, um, but um, yeah, that's it. So you, you and Sharon are both knowledgeable in EMP is what I'm hearing. Uh, I, I'm just an architect, well, and so I'm, I, I get out of my depth really fast. Uh, yeah. I was invited to speak in Texas. All right. Okay, well, let's get back to Paul now. And incidentally, I want to share that Paul Seyfried is Sharon Packer's business partner. So. Uh, this slide basically shows the uh, coverage uh, from the height of different heights of bursts of a weapon. So 30 miles, you know, I have to do the, the math real quick in my head. That's the 30 mile circle is probably the, the maximum uh, area of real estate that would be affected by a balloon delivered weapon. Um, there are cases of balloons, very large balloons being able to lift payloads up to several thousand pounds, up to 220,000 feet. Again, I would be skeptical of 
of that affecting more than the the smaller circle as far as uh, radius of destruction goes. The um, most practical way that an enemy would deliver an EMP attack would be either from a, a missile, which of course we would see being fired, uh, and, or a satellite. It's possible to put these on a satellite because they would be very small and uh, a, a 10 kiloton weapon would weigh approximately 100 kilograms, which is very easy to put on a satellite. Um, and that that satellite could be orbited or launched months or years before an attack and it would be in place and they would just basically coordinate coordinate their attack with um, um, the arrival time of the satellite over the desired point of detonation. So uh, there was one other thing I wanted to cover on my notes and that was security. Uh, 911 will not be there anymore and um, you're going to be responsible for your own security uh, because, well, I don't like the way people behave when they're well fed. <laughs> None of the riders that we've watched on our television screens the last two and a half years were starving. They were all well fed and uh, probably stopped at a nice restaurant before they participated in the riot. So I can only imagine what behavior is going to look like after there is no more drinking water or food in the store. Um, I, let's see, what else do we have for uh, slides? Yeah, this is, you know, these are the long transmission lines that we talked about. These, these will be very efficient um, harvesters of EMP RF energy. Um, there was a, there was a um, coronal mass ejection event that affected the Northeastern power grid in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you hunt around on the internet, you can find pictures of the um, huge transformer at a power plant that was melted down by that effect. But as Lowell Wood pointed out in his testimony that the effects of an EMP on the power grid would be more harsh than that generated by a coronal mass ejection. Now, as a side note, coronal mass ejection does not have the E1 and E2 components that a, a nuclear EMP does, only the E3 component. So your microelectronics would not be affected as long as they weren't connected to the grid, then be damaged by the E3. Um, let's see, what, are, what other slides do we have, Roseanne? Mm, got Can another one? about that? I, I, that doesn't trigger anything. All right. Um, Thank you. There is one. There is one paragraph that would that I'd like to read from Lowood's testimony, and that talks about the um, use of EMP in connection with the full-scale nuclear attack. And uh, a lot of Americans, you know, over the years, thought that there would be a man in a suit on our TV come on and warn us that there, an attack was imminent. And of course, that's complete fantasy. Uh, so what Lowell Wood said was Soviet strategic force, now this is in 2001. So this is after the collapse, 10 years, 11 years after the collapse. And so you have to you know, take, the, take that into context when you listen to this. Soviet strategic strike forces characteristically have featured weaponry well suited to efficient EMP generation over exceptionally wide areas. That EMP strike component exists today in the Russian strategic order of battle, moreover likely at its maximum Cold War strength. I very confidently predict that it will be one of the last features of Soviet strategic nuclear weaponry to be retired from the Russian strategic force structure. It has long been considered highly likely by U.S. strategic war planners that a Soviet first strike would commence with a multi-explosion laydown of high-intensity EMP all over the continental U.S. significantly before any target on the ground is brought under attack, simply because the cost of such an attack commencement is low and the benefits gained are great. Indeed, recollections of strategic war games long past have, as a major, major common feature, the beginning of the game with a massive Soviet EMP laydown all over the US followed immediately by an extended timeout while the game's referees rip up huge handfuls of US military capability of all types 
and throw it away as EMP ruined. So it is a very it is a very potent um, weapon. Uh, and I've read this testimony many times over the last twenty years, and and I I glossed over this one section. And after we got in, after getting more and more involved in Ukraine, this absolutely reached out and and grabbed me last time I read it. Uh, so bear in mind the recent news reports you know you've seen over the last year when I read you this. Um, this that scenarios of this general flavor are currently considered within the pale is illustrated by the Army 2020 war game conducted at Carlisle Barracks two years ago. So this was in 1999. Conducted at Carlisle Barracks two years ago. Especially notable for its openness, this exercise postulated a U.S. expeditionary force in the Ukraine clashing with an invading Russian force two decades hence. When the Russian force fared poorly on, in ground combat operations, the Russian general staff used a set of nuclear explosions in space to effectively destroy the high eyes and ears of the US military and most civilian commsats and Russian space systems as well in order to express national resolve. In addition to the far distant Russian nuclear explosions giving American decision makers real pause for thought, the entirely unexpected abrupt and total loss of the high ground confer conferred by US space assets nearly cost the American expeditionary force its collective skin. Just as the game was ending in a Russian-American armistice, the Chinese, noting America's unprecedented military incapacity, commenced to make their long-expected moves in the Far East. So for, for, a man, for a man to see this kind of thing 20 years ago is, was really amazing to me. Um, so the future is up in the air. Uh, we have no idea how all of this is going to shake out. And I think it is very important that all of us consider carefully what we're going to do uh, to prepare ourselves and our families in case this gets really bad. Thank you, Paul. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, let's take some questions. I definitely have some questions. Hello. Hello. Hi. May I ask a question here for our school? Go ahead. We teach preparedness and self-sustainability with permaculture design, water catching, filtration naturally. Okay. And so we feel like we have a long-term security plan. So families come here with up to 3,000 acres to learn to design their properties. Most of them are outside, but a lot of them, like myself, are inside. Um, what we'd like to do after we just had another EMP expert here in Utah that's trying to get the... Um, legislators, they're on a public utilities committee to really look at hardening the transformers here in Utah and stuff. But he couldn't tell us of someone who could teach us how to build a Faraday cage. Do you know anyone that could teach us, do a workshop? Um, Faraday cages, as I understand it, and I'm not an electrical engineer, but you know, I've kind of hung around with people who who dabble in this in a very serious way. A Faraday cage is fairly simple to make. Um, I wish we had our electrical engineer on board here. Um, basically, let, let me just cover one example. Um, if you had a galvanized steel container uh, and the skin thickness was 100 thousandths of an inch thick. So that's just a little bit less than an eighth of an inch thick. Galvanized steel, that's important. Uh, the attenuation of that skin between your the de protective device and the outside provides a, an attenuation factor of 126 decibels. Every six decibels will cut the dose rate or, or the signal strength in half. So that's about 22 halvings of the signal. So if you start with 50,000, well, let's start with 100,000 volts uh, per square meter. Uh, so the first halving would be 50,000 volts, and the second halving would be 25,000 volts, and the third 
having would be 12,000 volts and then 6,000 volts and 3,000 volts. I mean, by the time you get to 22 halvings, you're looking at a fraction of a volt per square meter um, signal strength field there, which is an enormous reduction in the threat. So you can get a fairly decent amount of protection by using say copper screen, if you could surround the object that you're trying to protect with copper screen because it conducts so well. Uh, and if you could effectively eliminate any seams in that screen, possibly by soldering or conductive tape, uh, that, that makes a, a very useful hedge against an EMP. Um, now the corrugated steel shelters that we built for 20 years, Th those were inherently uh, great Faraday cages. Um, Conex containers, shipping containers are not good Faraday cages because they have big gaps in the doors and the, and the floors under, uh, on the bottom are basically wooden. So you have you know, big openings, but even, even at that, being inside of a shipping container would offer an elevator level of protection versus being in the open. So um, there, there's an article that's available on the internet. And I'll, I'll say this a couple of times very slowly. It's called An Introduction to Nuclear Electromagnetic Pulse. An Introduction to Nuclear Electromagnetic Pulse by Future Science. It's a magazine. Uh, and the author's name is Jerry Emanuelson. Two, I think, uh, one M. Jerry Emanuelson. And um, when you're surfing around trying to find it, um, the first page will have a kind of a weird artist rendering of an EMP. And it has a very dark blue purplish hue to the page. That's it right there. Thank you for bringing that up. That is a very, very good report to read. Also on that front page that you see the blue, uh, it, it has a number of links that are highlighted in blue. You need to click on those links and read those extensively. Thank you for holding that up. That's very good. He, Jerry Emanuelson has been doing this for like 30 or 40 years. He's yeah. quite well qualified. Yes. Um, his book, Electromagnetic Pulse Protection. Yes. Uh, and he's still alive, by the way. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, read his, I refer to that report quite often. Uh, and in his, in his report, he worked a lot with uh, commercial radio and television transmitters. And um, he had sophisticated equipment that could measure the signals, the, the electrical field at the base of the radio station transmitters that he was working on. And he didn't like parking his car under the transmitter. And so he erected, I think it was an aluminum carport. So it was open on all sides, except just the roof over the top. And he was able to measure a significant drop in the strength of that electromagnetic field just by having that metal roof between the transmitter and the ground. So highly recommend you um, read that report. And when we're talking about these uh, Faraday cages, you know, we talk, Paul and I have talked a lot about even putting your equipment into a, a metal, um, metal garbage can. And, and uh, uh, if you can put that little bit of wiring around uh, uh, around the top of it, uh, you know, we don't want the slot antenna. But we're looking at um, we're we're looking at Faraday cages without wiring coming into that Faraday cage. And um, if you have wiring coming in, then it's a whole other ball game with all kinds of filters required and very expensive uh, equipment. Thank you for saying that, Sharon. Um, forgot to mention that. Um, so I think I think a lot of effort probably is wasted in trying to preserve um, appliances or, or instruments that were not are not going to be valuable to us if they don't function without this the infrastructure 
So your phone's not going to work because, you know, the networks will be down. And uh, although you'll be able to retrieve files and things that you have on it, that, that's useful. But other than that, the phone's going to be very limited and it's used to you. Um, I would like everybody to focus very hard on, on food, water, and essential medications, uh, training, you know, skills that you're going to need. Um, get that now. If you have dental work that needs to be done, get that done. Because, you know, I have an electrician who says he'll pull your tooth for $5, but really you want to have a professional do that. Um, yeah, get, take care of those loose ends now because uh, I, when I go to work, I carry a dosimeter in my pocket. That I am very, I am very concerned about where we are right now in this world. Um, a little known fact that is not talked about in the mainstream press, and that is our uh, Ohio class ballistic missile submarines are not coming into their bases, their home ports to exchange crews and replenish groceries. They are taking the crews and the groceries out to sea several hundred miles where the submarine surfaces and the crew exchange is done and the new groceries are put on board and the submarine you know, disappears between the, beneath the waves and goes on another 70 day patrol. The fact that the Navy is not bringing those subs into port is what I call a clue. So if the Navy's that nervous, I'm a little nervous. So do the best you can with what you have um, from where you are right now. Mr. Safer, may I ask you a question? Sure. Um, uh, the book, One Second After, I'm sure many of us are familiar with that book. Um, just going back to what you said with regards to big cities or even medium-sized cities for that matter, once the water stops coming in and the water runs out, people are going to need to go somewhere to get their water. And my question to you is, um, if, if you are in a medium to large city, um, would it not be prudent to um, have at least three to four months worth of drinking water on you so that you could stay where you are because everyone else is probably most likely going to leave to go to where they think water is. And if water is not inside the city, um, you know, and it's somewhere else, people are most likely going to migrate towards that. And that's exactly what they did in the book. One second after once the food and and water ran out, the people, the majority of people fled to the urban areas where there was food, where there were farmers, where there, where there was water. Um, and so I just want to get your opinion on that. Okay, that's a very good point. A um, couple of things. When I read the book, I noticed, I noted that uh, all of the vehicles stopped uh, from because of the pulse, and that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, of course, unless, you know, they use a, C a super EMP weapon, which would generate fields up in the 200,000 volt per square meter arena. But um, we, we can't know that until it happens. Um, the, the second thing is the, the typical farmer does not raise his own food anymore. The typical farmer now buys his groceries at Costco, just like you do. So the farmer, if you go to a farm, and expect him to have food that you can, you know, eat is is not realistic because they're going to be starving too. Um, and number three, most people don't have more than an eighth or a quarter of a tank of gas left in their car. And I think that when when things when people become very scared, they want to stay with what they know, and that's home. So people are going to have whatever food and water they have, you know, they have 40, 50 gallons of water in their water heater. They have several gallons of water in the pipes in their house. Uh, and, and most people are gonna go home because they don't understand what's going on and they're gonna wait and they're gonna try to protect their stuff, whatever that is. And 
I think they're going to wait there hoping that the utilities are going to come back on and things are going to resume as normal until, until it's too late to leave. And by that, I mean, they're either so dehydrated and hungry that they really don't have the strength to leave or the endurance to leave, or that the streets are now so dangerous because of all the civil disorder um, that it's, it's too late to leave. Uh, a good a good film for that is uh, called um, After Armageddon. It's based on a a pandemic scenario. It was made in I think 2015, uh, and and I think that was a pretty realistic illustration of what travel would be like when it gets to that point. Um, I but Bronsakotis in his formal speech uh, at the EMP conference in Delta, Utah, said that your chances of finding food and water are much better outside the city, which was his colorful and um, eloquent way of saying the cities will die. So he could be, he could be less reverent with, you know, me sitting across the table, but yeah, your chances are better, but I'm not sure that, that that would be a good course of action unless you have some place to go. Now, Here's another thing you need to consider, and that is you have like-minded friends, like one of the one of the commenters earlier. You have a community of people who can work together and you can share costs and and um, labor and expertise. Maybe somebody in your group's an electrician, maybe somebody is an engineer. You know, we need to use those resources to to have a rural place where we have water rather surface water or a well that reminds me you better have spare well motors because if those are connected to the grid they're toast and you're going to have to replace it and if it's not connected to the grid they wear out eventually anyway and the well motor store will be closed then but you need to have a place where you have pre-positioned equipment medical um, clothing shoes fuel everything that you're going to need and and so in, if you have to evacuate you want to have a place to go because just wandering around you know wandering around in rural areas not going to yield very good results yeah may, may i speak to this please sure thank you so i, I was um u.s army infantry from 1983 to 1995 and so I, I spent a fair amount of time carrying a backpack um i got away from that and went to gray bearded green beret survival class four days three nights in tennessee and got rained on and frozen for those days and at the end of the class we had a debrief and i talked about the ask asked the instructor about this topic you know about the bugging out topic because we were carrying about 50 pounds of gear not including food and there was very few of us that could cover the distance with the equipment um, and the instructor who does this professionally and has been Green Beret Ranger, and he's he's in my age category, he's you know, approaching 50 now. Um, he said, your best place to be is to make your home work, okay? Yeah. So I, I, we, we moved rural. We moved from San Francisco to rural Oregon, far out, out edge of Josephine County. And we had our own well and our own septic and land to do permaculture, which I, there's a permaculture group on here. I highly support permaculture concepts and I have some links in the chat you can find for that. So the ability to provide your own water on a well, exactly what you said, back it up with a manual pump. I, I put, put a link in here for that. Those are all essential things. But if you're caught in the urban grid, um, you still do have your, your social network there, but you won't have water. And so you can live three days, three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. Does you? And so we all get worried about food and ammo, but air and water have got to be your highest two priorities. And if your if your air is contaminated, which we just saw in Palestine, Ohio, and everybody upstream of that, which I have a client in that range, and I had to check the flights to make sure I wasn't going the wrong place. But those are some very basic concepts. So living away from rural, because you've just successfully outlined what your rural place should have. The well, the septic, all your pre-positioned gear, but not being part of that community. What what I realized was the reason we needed to move rural was to get part of that community and then also to get control of your gear. In the short time we had for closing between making the offer and closing the loan in three weeks, 
the tweakers broke in and took all the wiring out of our garage. Oh. And so we had, I mean, even, even the, even the cable from the, from the opener to the outlet. So I had to replace the opener because they cut, they cut. And so th this, this, the, the uh, rural America has changed. You know, it, it, it's not as safe as it was when I was a kid. So we now have the, the crystal meth creates this person that's called the tweaker. They don't sleep. They stay up all night and they 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 tear things apart and, and they break into homes and they take vehicles. And so if you're not boots on the ground to protect your stuff, it's not going to be there when you get there. And um, so well, in our experience, we've got good neighbors that look out for each other and we're far off the road where we can't be seen. And it, it's a lot of work to get into where we are. So Perfect. tweakers don't like to do a lot of work. But you did raise a very good point, And that is, most of us are not 20-year-old infantrymen anymore. Yes, and a me lot either. Of, a lot of us have enjoyed the benefits of fine restaurants for a, a period of decades. <laughs> and so um, being able to walk with 50 pounds, you go, well, most of us are not accustomed to 12 hours of hard work, let's say in the summer or winter. You know, if we think we're going to grow our own food, you know, most of the people who are serious about this are 50, 60, 70 years old. And we're not used to farming with a hoe and a pick and carrying water for 12 hours a day. Okay, so even young families, though, we, we moved to rural Oregon as a family with a toddler and my wife expecting number two. We didn't have the time or energy to plant the traditional garden, but permaculture, when you start planting, first you start working on all your, your perennials, your, your orchard trees, and okay, what's what works in our your grapevines and blackberries and things that are going to be native to your your, uh, your climate. Um, when you get those things established, you get a good base of some, and then look, look at what the locals do. Some of the locals have chickens, some of the locals have goats and networking with those folks. And then you learn. So a lot of the local people are more preppers than we'll ever be because they just live that way for the last yeah. 40 years. And so it's, um, it's almost over, baby. We shut the door because the bugs are just swarming out here. We've made a, a conscious Come effort. Here, to Come here. Go ahead. Um, we've made a conscious effort to meld in with the customer, uh, the, the uh, the neighbors around us and that's very important to be able to you know they know you and you know them uh because when this gets bad it's going to take a cooperative effort the confrontation is not what we want we want to cooperate with the people around us 100 percent. yeah yes thank you so much for that answer i really appreciate it guys is there a way for tacto members in the same vicinity to be able to contact one another to establish that community? Um, well, I can be reached. I, I, I don't mind giving out my phone number. It's on my website, but it's uh, 801. You're in St. George, right? Uh, I'm not. I'm in West Jordan. Oh, really? That's where I'm at. Okay. See, there you go. So, <laughs> my, uh, What's your phone number again? Paul? Yes. Paul? This is going to be on YouTube, so you might want you might not want to give your phone number like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, why don't you t uh, email Tacta info at Tacta dot org, and I okay. can give you Paul's phone number. Thanks. So I was going to say this earlier. I was um, I was muted, but um, we don't have the ability on our website to connect people in um, the same area, but we do have. Um, we have a Facebook page and you can contact each other that way. And also, um, it's one of the reasons why we do these presentations is so that you can get to know each other. You can give each other your email on the chat. You can give each other um, other information like that. But just remember that on these on these presentations, um, they're recorded and they will be going on YouTube. Thank you. So anybody that wants to get a hold of each other, you can contact me at info at and um, I can try to help you get a hold of each other that way too. Very good. Well, I have a question here. Um, prior on the, your discussion, you talked about an isolation transformer, and we've certainly talked about some of the devices uh, Dr. Bradley is associated with. 
which I understand are very good and effective at uh, perhaps stopping the E3 pulse. Um, what I'm concerned about is you, the E1 pulse has got such a quick rise, it's a short, short wavelength that it uh, does not need to couple into long lines. It directly goes to the electronics, as I understand. I'm not an electrical engineer, but it goes straight into the chips or the, the small electronics. So even if we're able to protect our systems with you know, uh, blocking the E3 pulse, have we really accomplished anything or is the E1 pulse going to destroy everything? We have nothing to power. Um, that That's a valid concern. Uh, the the testing has, uh, Brownie and Sakota, so actually ran the testing phases on everything. Uh, he said that he, he his advice was that solar panels were very resilient against EMP, uh, but you have to be, you have to be cognizant of of preventing signal coupling to the wiring that can be that can be detrimental to the panel. So sure, sure, I, I understand that. I guess where I struggle though is even if the panel survives, I still have my charge controllers right. and inverters. Right, they're going to be destroyed though. Directly, well, but I don't know that. Redundancy, <laughs> redundancy, redundancy. <laughs> Get another set and put them in. Put them in a garbage can. Have spares. It, have spare inverters. Parts, yeah, but inverters are very expensive. <laughs> they are, um, but then so is not having water. So uh, the water we 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 pull water from a surface source. It's a stream, mountain stream, mm -hmm. and we filter it with. Um, a system that costs us about five thousand dollars to engineer but uh we we filter that surface water and with good results um and we're dependent upon electricity to do that and we have other systems you know gravity systems and pump systems and so forth but but uh i i want to be able to wash my truck with filtered water okay i want a lot of water i i want to i want to thrive not just survive so I wanted a lot of water for whatever purpose I wanted it for. And um, I, I would look at you know spare parts and doing the best you can to protect the parts that you're relying on now. Okay, thank you. For your information, that uh, electrobatic pulse document by Jerry Emanuelson, I, I emailed that to TACT uh, several months ago. So if you look back, I mean, you could distribute that to everyone if you wanted to. Yeah, it, it should be posted. I, I, I send the link to that to everyone who calls me. I, I get calls almost every day from around the country, you know, people wanting to do something to help their families, you know, because nobody's coming to save you. Rescue is not on the way. Civil defense in the United States is, is non-existent. It's the truth. You Any know, uh, no, and I have a couple of comments, if I may. Uh, in 2010, Russia built 5,000 new bomb shelters just in the Moscow area. 255,000. That they had in World War II. And their war plan feels that nuclear war is winnable. Absolutely. They, they sincerely <laughs> believe that. Uh, in 2014, actually, they built 255,000 shelters in the Moscow Military District it, since 2005. 255,000. And in 2014, they moved 60 million, not 16 million, six zero million Russians to harden shelters for a four-day civil defense exercise. It involved 200,000 government civil defense workers. Uh, in 2016... And you can look this up on Google, it's in there. In 2016, they only moved 40 million Russians to harden shelters for a four day civil defense exercise. Um, there's another good source to look up on uh, you, or, um, Google, and that is CNN, comma, Helsinki, as in Finland, Helsinki shelters. So that is a seven and a half minute run. Oh yeah, I've seen those. And uh, they take you, they take a CNN reporter 60 feet under the city in, in shelter, a huge shelter that you could park two 747s in. And they said that they could shelter all 960,000 inhabitants of the city, including visitors. 
and they had a shelter capacity for 82% of the country in hardened shelters. So, you know, little countries like that can afford to do it. They just have the national will and we, we're busy with other things. Well, they live right next door to Russia and they lived through World War II. We well, so have... do we. We live right next to Russia too because the flight time is about the same. <laughs> Uh, what, what, one other thing I'll add just to let everybody be cheerful, and I just read this about 20 minutes ago, that um, NATO is concerned that Russia has uh, dispatched or launched all of their submarines, all of them. That could be posturing. I don't, know if, they could, I don't know if they could launch all of them because some of them are in dry dock for two to four years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We certainly can't. We've got four Ohio's in dry dock right now. Yeah. Okay, well, all not being necessarily literal, but okay. But yeah, I but I, I get what you're saying. All their available submarines have been put to sea, so yeah. that's concerning. I thought you were going to cheer us up. Yes. Hello? Hello, all. Okay, Good go ahead, Dave. Uh, if I, uh, by the way, my name's Dave Staples. This is my first time on your chat with uh, the Zoom call. Is it true that the Russians had, uh, they conducted their dr uh, uh, nuclear fallout drills last week, the entire country? I don't, I don't know that. I haven't seen that, anything like that. Uh, somebody told me that tonight and I'm like, they did that all week? It wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, I know that six months ago, the Swiss government told all their citizens to clean out their bomb shelters and make them ready. That's ridiculous. Uh, uh, Roseanne? Yes. Uh, can I show a card? A card? A card, my card. On, on... Uh, you can, as long as you don't mind it being shown on YouTube a lot of times. I don't care. I don't care. What is the card? Oh, you're selling disaster kits? Yeah, disaster kits and solar panels. Oh, okay. Small and, and small. I think everybody should have, uh, you know, you were talking about water. You can't store enough water. I mean, you, you need to have some way to purify your water, either yep. from rainwater or ponds or something, because just just to look at some of the stuff going on, you, we can't, you can't store enough water. Nope. <laughs> so you need to be able to purify it. I don't know if it's going to cost you $5,000 or not for a reverse osmosis or maybe even a small Sawyer or something just to be ready. I, you know, well, I, it, it concerns me about what's going on. It's, I, it's, it really does. The Sawyer is a very good portable filter system. Um, but I'm interested in seven or eight gallons a minute. Well, it, that's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. Uh, I, I, because I plan on, you know, having, couple of dozen people to, to take care of. So the $5,000 is, is a- is Yeah, a, well, if it's that many people, yeah. Yeah, that involves uh, three different levels of sediment removal. So you're starting with uh, actually four now, uh, 90 micron pre-filters, five micron, one micron, and, and a nano filter that grabs 99.99. How many people? How filter. many people are we talking about? You know, probably 20 or 30. So you got to have a lot of water. Just, and yeah, that's just a lot of 30 feet. gallons a day. <clears throat> so that's just, one that's gallon good. per person per day. But that's not personal that's hygiene, minimum. cooking and uh, you know, laundry. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me started on the importance of personal hygiene. I mean, the, Napoleon. Well, we got to be clean. I know that. Yeah, you got to stay clean. So um, the, the Africa Corps in World War II was... Um, rendered in, inoperative because the British forces kept the Germans on the run to the point where they couldn't launder their clothes and their underwear. And they all had uh, horrible skin diseases uh, where we won't talk about. And uh, the, the, the whole army basically fell apart because they couldn't do laundry. Um, Napoleon's army was destroyed by a little uh, animal called the louse. Uh, and they, they got typhus in Poland and 
Napole and Napoleon went into Russia with 650,000 troops and he came home with less than uh, 5,000 and a year later only 1,000 could report for duty. So um, personal hygiene and, and uh, health care is extremely important. But yeah, we, you, you understand the water thing very well. Oh, yeah, very well. Yes. I'm from South Florida. I mean, you know, we get hurricanes every year now. So, I mean, we need water. Sometimes you got too much water. <laughs> There's never too much. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? I posted a link to the water filter that we recommend for clients and that we actually had at our home in Oregon. Our, our well had a uh, an issue and we were prescribed this uh, multi-canister filtration plus UV light filter. Um, and so uh, it, the, the one I, I linked up above is the high flow one that would get that seven or eight gallons per minute that Paul is referring to. Uh, it did cost us over $1,200, like $1,700 installed. Um, but it, it met our requirements and worked for seven years without any hiccup and went to the next owner. Very good. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Any more questions? Have we satisfied everybody, really? We won't sleep for a while. What's that? <laughs> We're not going to be sleeping well for a while. <laughs> uh, Roseanne, I've been yeah. talking to you. Thank you for texting me. Oh, sure. I would love to do hands-on skills workshops. We do experts live streaming like this, but I would like our families would love to get together and bring an expert in that knows how to build a Faraday cage. We bring everything, mm -hmm. we do it ourselves. So we know mm -hmm. we've done it right. Mm -hmm. Other skills as well. I have T-Jack. He is a special forces medic, police officer, slash the Bear Gorillas of Utah. Uh, he does amazing primitive skills and everything else. He has a YouTube channel as well, T-Jack and others. Um, I would love to do hands-on stuff. How about everybody else? Do you guys ever do that with TACTA? Yeah, yeah that'd be good, sure. What are you saying? Yeah. You, you would like to present something or you would like something presented to you in person? So we'd like to do it together in person. And we would all, like you guys have experts, we have experts. We would all pick a different subject that everybody wants to come and learn. And we throw a workshop with the expert. Mm -hmm. Like we used to do at preparedness fairs, but we don't do it anymore. Right. You can't get enough training in um, medical. I think it's a great, it's, it's a great opportunity. Yes. Um, email me what, and we'll set something it? up and we will, we'll, um, film it for our members at TACTA so you can all benefit from it. Okay. Um, I suppose that most of the people on this chat own a firearm. And if you do, I would urge you to um, get competent professional law enforcement training because you cannot afford to have an accident. You cannot afford an accident so if you because there won't be any level one trauma centers available so an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure in this regard you say law enforcement training you need you want a law you, you want can, a law enforcement trainer a professional trainer who teaches right. law enforcement okay so do I go to my police station to get that? No, no, uh, I can recommend to you a number of law enforcement trainers, but these are people who are serious trainers. Okay. And, and um, you don't want the guy who's just, he's a gun enthusiast and hung a shingle out. And now I'm a gun instructor. So if you live in Utah, can you share who that would be? Or do you need to do that? In um, yeah. Um, um, Hold on one second. Um, Roseanne, just while he's looking that up, we mm -hmm. just had one speak at our group of preparedness families on a live stream, and he's going to take us out in good weather. And he used to train police. He trained um, the concealed carry trainings, and mm -hmm. he is a manufacturer of weapons and ammo. He's right oh. here in Utah County, and he's going to give us a hands-on workshop. So I'll share that with you so you can share it with the group. Oh, great. What What's his name? His name is Glenn Parshall. Okay. He I manufactures just, for a, a gun store. 
a corollary topic. I just posted a link to the, uh, I think it's called the American Surgeons Association Stop the Bleed Training. Uh, we used to lose a lot of people to far firearm wounds uh, through loss of blood in, in combat situations. And we were trained at a certain level back in my era. But since the war on terror, Afghan and our, uh, Iraq, those theaters, we've learned a lot more about keeping people alive with tourniquets and wound packing and quick clot clotting agents, chemicals that cause the blood to clot to get people temporary stability until they get to the real uh, uh, trauma center. So Stop the Bleed is a one day seminar that's offered around the country. It's like a 12 hour seminar to get you the basics of what would be a two week seminar for what's called TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And we took that for our church security training. They actually brought in sides of pork and had them ballistically damaged, both fire, firearm and knife wounds. And we learned how to wound pack. We learned how to do tourniquets on each other. This was the next tier after taking a full uh, first for, uh, Red Cross first aid training with a full CPR thing. That, this is your next tier training. Um, because if you're handling firearms, most of us that are in that world also carry what's called an IFAC, an individual first aid kit, which mm -hmm. is now available in like an ankle bracelet size now. So that if you had something go wrong, you can you can self treat and stabilize before you you know you can bleed out before you get to the hospital. If we can stop that, they can keep you alive. Absolutely, I'm glad you brought up the tourniquets. I carry an IFAC in the cargo pocket of my work pants every day because if I need a tourniquet, I need it right now. Hundred percent. It cannot be in the trunk of my car. I need it now. Mm -hmm. Need it right now. I'm the only person at work. I work in a pharmaceutical packaging plant, and uh, we have moving machinery all over the place. And, and, and if you're around, yeah, if you're around children, you need a different one. There, there, because the standard one doesn't go down to a, a small child size injury. And so, you can research that online. But there is another brand that has a, 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 a it's, it's very good for children. But I didn't know that. So the the, the 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 standard cat tourniquet, the black one that we all see, it doesn't cinch down small enough for small children. And I can't remember. My pack is in the car for my. I have a school walking group, and I wear a backpack with a first aid kit in it. There's another. There's another one that the green bearded, gray bearded green beret recommended for small children and animals. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but we bought. They were more expensive. We bought a couple. I'll, I'll shut up. Um. Hey, um, Paul. Yes. We've got a question from Blade. Blade, did you have a question? You've got your virtual hand raised. You're muted. Why didn't you see that? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Was that? Yes. Oh, uh, my, sorry. Hold on, Bill. My question was, uh, what what would be the effects of an EMP on a bond dominium uh, a metal house, um, in, in your opinion? Um, the structure that we have is a metal, all metal building. Uh, it yeah. does, it does attenuate the effects of EMP to a certain degree. I, I don't have the instruments that measure that. I, I can't quantify it, but it does help. Uh, we had to install a uh, cellular repeater on the building so that we could get phone calls in and out of the building reliably. So yeah, a metal, metal, a metal building helps, of course, but of course, you'll, if you have grid power coming into the building, that is going to conduct all that energy into your appliances anyway. The, we've installed the, uh, the EMP blocker, that E1, E2, E3 blocker on the uh, circuit breaker main panel yeah the isolation transformer yes yes that would that would go a long way to protect your stuff fantastic thank you for your time thank you blade bill did you have a comment yes uh i don't know how many's familiar with this but uh, the survival medicine uh, handbook is an excellent excellent book it's pretty thick you can see i've used it a bit i can uh, see that <laughs> but it's uh dr bones uh, you can get him on the internet. It's an excellent, excellent uh, resource. I think I met him at a preparedness fair a long time ago. Yeah, they also do big medical kits. They're a bit expensive, but uh, 
a lot of uh, thought has gone into uh, the preparation of those kits. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of them. I, I have the large one, yeah. Yeah, excellent comment. All right, any, any more questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Hey, it's Richard Beitendorp, Paul. So you talked about an isolation transformer. Um, or is there some, is there a manufacturer that typically you can get those from or where can you get something like that? Uh, I think you'd have to talk to a qualified electrician. I'm sure they know what they are. I am not an electrician. Okay. I will look into it. <laughs> Is it possible that the notes in the chat would be available to us? I am going to uh, I'm going to work on getting those. There's a lot of comments, so I think it'll be um, it'll be good to have those saved. So I'll post them with the link to the YouTube video. But you know, do you know what a snipping tool is? Mm -hmm. That I was trying to do that. With the snipping tool, and I somehow I, I, I lost the chat. <laughs> I don't know. Well, right. there it's it's um it's kind of going like crazy, so it's hard to it's hard to snip and keep up. Okay. In closing, uh, I would like to say that in around two thousand three or four, Sharon Packer and I were summoned to the state of New Jersey to train a couple of hundred FEMA trainers, FEMA disaster planners for the state. And uh, they asked us to talk about um, shelter concepts, uh, weapons effects, and EMP problems. And uh, we thought that all these trainers are going to be bored and doodling on their notepads and going to sleep. But we were surprised by the fact that only two of them out of the group had heard of EMP. And they were riveted by the discussion on weapons effects and shelter design concepts. Nobody, they took careful notes, they paid attention, except their boss stayed out in the hall the, all, the whole time and, and made conversation with a couple of uh, aides. But the rest of them, this was all new material to them. That, you know, if you're relying on FEMA to uh, come to your rescue, um, it's not gonna work out well. Very true. We like to say that civil defense begins at home. Yes. All right. Absolutely. Any other questions? We still have a lot of people here. You're hanging out for your question. Um, I just went to my doctor, and uh, the comment was made uh, in the chat that we're going to need antibiotics more than anything because, indeed, infection will be a problem. I just went to my doctor and said, hey, uh, uh, let's see, you gave me ciproflaxin and another one. And uh, he gave me a prescription with six refills for those two antibiotics. And I just stocked up on them for my kids. And I went back six months later and he gave them to me again. All I got to do is ask. I mean, not every doctor is going to do that, but. You have a good doctor. I know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is, is there a, a is lot there of doctors? You know, is there I, a short life or refrigeration concern with modern antibiotics? Uh, the military spent a couple of hundred million dollars researching how long their antibiotics would actually last versus the expiration date because they were throwing away about $5 billion worth of antibiotics every year. And they found out that most antibiotics retain their potency uh, at least 15 years and probably 20, except doxycycline and tetracycline become toxic a year after the expiration date. So they, they'll hurt you. But uh, the other ones, you just need to use a little bit more of it to get the same effect. Um, my oh, doctor, I've, I've been told that uh, that is no longer true with doxycycline. Uh, doxycycline, in fact, the government just uh, extended their uh, supply for five years. Huh. Uh, the newer... Uh, formula they're using the way they're preparing the doxycycline works now. Okay, that's good to know. Also, uh, you can get five, if you're familiar with the uh, article that uh, uh, the female doctor wrote, uh, Armageddon Medicine. Uh, 
she says there's seven antibiotics you should try to get. Chase Medical, uh, you can get it, J-A-S-E medical.com will give you five of those seven. Uh, you call in, you have a, a short conference with a physician and they will send you a kit with those five medications in it. That's good to know. Thank you for get, uh, giving us that. Um, I was, my doctor won't, won't write me blanket bulk prescriptions anymore, but he used to. But we did build a shelter for a doctor in Montana. And uh, he asked us if there was anything he could do for us. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> do you have your prescription pad? And he said, oh, yes, I do. So he wrote me nine bulk prescriptions for ciprofloxacin and cephalexin and um, all, all kinds of stuff. And um, I, took, I took the first three of them into a Costco pharmacist. And I said, can you fill these? And he looked at them <laughs> and he handed them back to me and said, no. Okay, thank you. So I went to the next Costco and he looked at him and said, come back tomorrow. So I went back the next day and there was a big bag of antibiotics there for me. And eventually, and over the period of two weeks, he filled all nine of them. You know, he wasn't shy about it. So, you know, if you don't succeed first, try and try again. All day chemist, you might try all day chemist too. For that, I, I was buying ivermectin from them for the last three years. I have a question about water. Um, hi, this is Dana. Can you hear me? Yes. My question is, we've talked about purifying water, but I was wondering if anyone knows if there would be any impact on the safety of surface water after a nuclear attack. And good question. Um, There's a book called Nuclear War Survival Skills. They teach you how to build a, a crude filter from a five gallon bucket using soil, gravel, and towels. And it's uh, got to be a clay type soil. Yeah, clay type soil. Uh, we'll filter that out. Will bind to the beta. Yeah, there, there are ways to filter that, but I think if you have real good filters and carbon filter, you know, a big bulk carbon filter, um, and a good set, a, a multi-layered sediment filter that you'll be better. You know, you, I don't think it'll be a major problem to you. It also depends on how deep that surface water is because you want the contaminants to settle to the bottom. Um, yeah, it's possible to filter that, but you know, it, what's the risk of not drinking any water? <laughs> Yeah, you know, exactly. the United Nations has a publication on how to build a water filtration system uh, that you can size to a family or an entire village. And it was intended for use in Africa for communities to provide clean water. Uh, it's been years since I've seen that, but there's a, a manual that tells you how to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess I was wondering if my Berkey would be enough for my Sawyer water filters, but I'm not sure you know they don't have clay it first uh, dana i just i just posted the uh pdf for nuclear war survival skills in the chat if you'd like it it's it's free via thank pdf you. you do have to purchase the book though thank you so we sell the book on tacta if you want the actual book on tacta.org also we have an article called radioactive water that talks about contaminated water um from radiation that you can find in our Journal of Civil Defense. And I'm looking for it right now, but if you just go to, you you have to be, you have to log in with your membership, but go to the journal archives and type in radioactive, you should be able to find it. Thank you. Yes. So, excuse so, me. Yes. If you build a water filter and nuclear war survival skills, you have to be very patient. <laughs> it takes a long time. Paul, Paul, could you speak briefly to the, the rule of seven and 10 on radioactive decay? Okay, um, yeah. Or Sharon Packer, we have a nuclear engineer right here. She can do cover seven, 10 even better than I can. Sharon, you're muted. You're muted. The basic uh, concept is that after seven hours, we lose 90% of the gamma radiation. But uh, here we're assuming one lay down. And so, uh, I, I would assume that we would get most of our lay down within a day, but but um, 
Seven hours, we will lose 90%. After seven times seven hours, which is about two days, we lose another 90%. And after seven times two days, which would be two weeks, then we lose another 90%. So that's, that's a huge loss. And so those first few days are extremely important to us. And uh, a lot of you are shielding in basements and places that don't have a lot of shielding overhead. But if you can get internal shielding from the bottom up, something, a heavy, heavy table, like a pool table or something that you can put shielding on top, if you could stay there for the first two days, then it becomes a, a tolerable level once you get out. And, uh, and we recommend a couple of feet of concrete in your ceilings, which is just not practical for a lot of us, a lot of people. But, uh, but if you will um, consider that quick uh, uh, decay attenuation, uh, you know, that the little bit of shielding inside will, will go a long ways. And you can stand anything. I mean, you can live under a table for two days if you have enough water and a little bucket for sanitation. So uh, that's... One, one, you're, you're a specialist in the the metal uh, shielding that you, you talked about your galvanized shielding shelter. Um, our, our, we do a little more things with concrete and uh, to get that shielding level, the equivalent with, with a metal is three feet of soil, correct? Is that in with two well, feet? Uh, maybe uh, every four inches of soil will attenuate one half the radiation. And we like to get 10 halvings, which would be 40 inches. And so you could certainly have some good shielding at 40 if you're just looking at gamma radiation and, and just from the fallout. But uh, of course, there's other types. There's, there's initial radiation and uh, from the neutrons, depending on how close you are to that target. But, uh, but uh, certainly 40 inches would go a long ways to get you some really good fallout protection over your concrete shelter. We, we generally bury the steel shelters to a depth of 10 feet. So the protection factor would be over a billion. And we're not looking so much for the protection factor when we do that. We're looking for the warm blanket. And yeah. that warm blanket of soil, that's going to protect us from the heat and from the cold. And uh, so winter or summer, we're pretty comfortable with that much soil. But uh, uh, a, a good corrugated steel pipe shelter, it uh, takes care of not only the, the, uh, the fallout, but it takes care of EMP and and the blast protection, uh, you get a huge blast protection when you double the diameter of that shelter. But um, a concrete shelter, uh, there's a lot of advantages to concrete as well. And you get a lot of uh, uh, multi-use out of a concrete shelter. And you can use those under a, a building where we don't, uh, we don't recommend putting con uh, steel shelters under a building because of the settling issue. But the concrete shelters are wonderful too. Uh, you just have to make sure you get the, the proper shielding and and um, um, we work with both quite a bit. What is it you do, Sharon? Is that a, a company you have? Well, Paul and I did uh, steel shelters, the corrugated steel pipe shelters oh, for gotcha, a long time. Gotcha, gotcha. But now, gotcha. uh, with, uh, now with, I am uh, designing concrete shelters. And so most of my work now is in selling uh, ventilation systems and, uh, and uh, uh, blast doors for concrete shelters. So we do the design and we work with uh, whatever architect it is that, that we're working with. And, and uh, uh, Dave is, is one of them, but we have, uh, we have quite a few that we're working on right now. Thank you. Sharon, could I ask you, have you heard about the um, hempcrete that literally shields everything as bulletproof? Have you heard any of that being any use in these shelters? Uh, and what did you call it? It's called hemp crete, H E M P. They take the waste of the hemp plants after the CBD farms produce the CBD oil, and that structure is so solid. It's bulletproof, waterproof. It's um, amazing, antifungal, bacterial. It's um, what wow. else is it? Thermal. I, I, uh -huh. Well, and and there are you know there are good building materials, but keep in mind that attenuation of radiation. Um, that is mass. It's the number of electrons we're looking at. You know, if you have get a heavy molecule, then uh, then you're, you're going to be able to attenuate. Yeah, I, I, I think that the hemp product is an organic product, so it's going to have the performance similar to Earth. But whereas the, you know, uh, everything. 
probably getting my hand in this, but it's a matter Another option would be to use concrete masonry units. They're eight inches by four inches by 16 inches, and you can just pile those into whatever thickness you want, and that's concrete masonry units. Yeah, but they're hollow. You, you, need, to, you, you need to do that. No, they're not hollow. They're solid. Solid block. Okay, solid, solid block. block. So that's so, stackable. You can stack that over a real sturdy wooden framework yeah. in your basement. Exactly. And by the way, well, it's easy to do. I mean, you just stack them. Yeah, they're cheap. Well, they were cheap. I'm not sure anything's cheap anymore. But... <laughs> well, this has been a very interesting discussion. I'm glad everybody participated. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for thanks for hanging out with us so long. I think we've gone an hour over our time, and it's probably getting really late back east for our members back there so i think i think we should call it a night okay thank you, you so much all. thank you for presenting and preparing that information for us and thanks everyone for getting on the, the meeting tonight um, utah valley permaculture what's that substance called that you said again i'm sorry it is called hemp crete H E M P Crete. And now oh, they're building you. them as earth shelters in the ground because they're thermal, 57 degrees all year long, and they're oh, waterproof. Yeah, but in Utah, we asked one county we wanted to build one in. They said you'd still have to build a concrete shell around your hempcrete shelter in the ground. We're like, okay, that's just more expense, but that sounds perfect, doesn't it, for a, a bomb shelter, <laughs> a uh, nuclear shelter? I'd have to have more information on that. I can get you in touch. I've got your phone number, Paul. I'll okay. get you in touch with the manufacturer, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Thank okay. you, be safe. Thanks thank, a lot. thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Thank you, good night.